Broadcasting from the commodity capital of the world, Zurich, Switzerland, this is Insider's Guide to Energy. This addition to Insider's Guide to Energy is brought to you by Fidectus. Go to www.fidectus.com for more information. Welcome to Insider's Guide to Energy. I'm your host, Chris Sass, and with me as always is Johan Oberg. Johan, what's going on? Hey, Chris. Great to be on again. Uh, really looking forward to another show, and this one specifically. Uh, I've read a lot about this one, and we did a, quite a bit of prep for this one. But other than that, summer holidays are coming up here in Europe, and uh, looking forward to uh, some time off here in the next coming weeks as well. How yeah, about you? Summertime in Europe is always my favorite time of year. Markets are a bit crazy. We, we had stuff on the European markets last week. It's a strange time in energy, but like yourself, I am really excited to have this guest today. Um, you know, it's our second author on, on the podcast since we've been going here. And which is really exciting is it's, it's a timely topic. It, it's kind of, um, kind of going through things that happen in the US, but I, I don't think it's history. I think it's actually a lesson learned and it's a little bit of predictive future, a part of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, so I'm excited. Any thoughts that you have about where we're gonna to go today? No, I, I agree with you. And I, I think what, what, what I think is really, really interesting, this kind of wraps around the entire energy industry and in terms of how it works. And we've had on the discussions in the show before, and I'm looking to, to explore this a little bit more in terms of what, how do you drive something that is so important in the market on a mixture between private and, and kind of governmentally owned and regulation and non-regulation? And how does this actually play? Is, there, is that really possible? Uh, so so quite, quite interesting to hear a little bit about this, but obviously the whole story is, is fascinating going back you know, a long, long time. But as you said, it's also gonna lead us into the future because I don't think this is a historic uh, challenge alone. So I, I too am excited. I understand the regulation, the private part. I think we're being a little bit silly to our audience because we haven't really told them what we're talking about. We're being a little bit abstract intentionally. So rather than continuing this virtual conversation, why don't we invite our guest onto the show and actually tell the audience what we hope to talk about? So I'm proud to have with us Catherine Blunt, the author of California Burning on the show. Welcome to Insider's Guide to Energy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, I am was very, very happy when you accepted the, the offer to be on the, the podcast. Uh, we're recording this before your book is released. So we were very grateful to get to read an early copy of your book to prep for this interview. And I am sure that it's going to be a big hit. Uh, some of our listeners and we have some um, producers that live in the West Coast. And I mentioned what we were working on. And they said, that stuff's in the news all the time. That's really interesting. So I have a feeling our audience is going to be really interested. Um, but let's start a little bit about who you are professionally. You're obviously an author. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about what got you into energy and, and why we're talking today? Absolutely. So uh, I uh, am, am a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, primarily. Um, and I began writing about power and renewables and utilities very, very shortly before um, the campfire, which destroyed the town of Paradise in Northern California in November 2018. And it became pretty clear shortly after that fire that uh, it, the, the fire itself was ignited by a failed power line owned by Pacific Gas and Electric. And so, you know, for me covering utilities, it, it, was, uh, it was a big story and it was one that required a great deal of work and a great deal of investigation. And so I kind of threw myself into that uh, alongside a couple of colleagues and we produced some, some work that ultimately serves as the foundation of this book about um, not just you know, the, the campfire itself, but the circumstances that led to this moment that was, um, you know, of extreme consequence for this company. And uh, so I, you know, I still write about renewables and power. Um, it's a very, very interesting time to be in the space, as listeners know, um, becomes more interesting by the day. So we can go in any number of directions today. So 
So you, you report on utilities day job. You, you saw this interesting story develop and you turned it into a book or, or you and your, your, your colleagues did, did the foundational work there. Um, I, I guess to me, reading the book, I mean, it was almost like reading a thriller or whatever. It was, it was a page turner for lack so of a better term it. for me. Um, <laughs> as I was telling in the pre-call with Johan, it's like, you can't even make this stuff up. It, it, it is just really a surreal story. So maybe we should start with the premise of, of what happened for our audience, because we have a global audience. So obviously, I think our West Coast folks or pretty much most of the American audience would understand the campfire because it was pretty main front page news for a long time. Right. Um, right. But maybe not the history of, of how it started and where it went and then some of the ramifications. Absolutely. So so the campfire in, in November 2018 it was absolutely catastrophic. It was it was an enormous fire, and ultimately it killed eighty four people. So it, this that this that story you know was clear in its significance, right? Um, but this this company PG and E has a history of starting fires. Uh, there was um, a, a, it started a spate of fires in uh, twenty seventeen that destroyed a lot of um, homes and 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 took a lot of lives in the in the North Bay area around Sonoma and Napa, the wine country. Um, there was a, there was another fire in 2015, um, and and also just a year in year out, a number of smaller fires that don't get a lot of uh, news or scrutiny, but nevertheless are the result of of down power lines. Um, so, when my colleagues and I approached this story uh, for the Wall Street Journal, um, at first it was very much focused on what were the specific, kind of the specific modes of failure that led to the campfire in its you know its catastrophic nature this we focused a lot on um, issues with age of transmission lines and maintenance of those higher voltage wires um, but then we ultimately zoomed out and and tried to explain the series of circumstances that converged to create this really challenging moment for this company. And to do that, you have to look very closely at 20 years of history. Um, very much focused on California, but also nationally to think about the way energy regulation has changed over the last number of years, uh, how energy policy has changed uh, in California and, and nationally. Um, some of the, the goals set by state regulators for these utilities, or, or rather state legislatures and state legislators and enforced by state regulators um, as it related to procuring renewable energy. Um, and also uh, the fact that the climate in Northern California has changed substantially um, in the last 20 years. You've, you, you've had a series of, of protracted droughts that scientists say have been very much exacerbated by warming climate. Um, and with that, um, very serious issues uh, related to tree mortality. Um, basically, the consequence of a single spark is so much higher than it than it was even you know ten years ago as a result of the, the millions of trees that have died for lack of water and disease caused by pests. So um, there was an underestimation of that risk, uh, which which further co um, compounded the challenges that this company is is still grappling with. So that's the kind of the you know the thousand foot view. Um, Obviously, there's there's a million ways to take that. So, happy to talk about anything. So, so out of curiosity, when when you when you addressed this uh, initially, did you ever did you ever have the thought around the scope of this one? You, you, you know, there, there's been fires before, as you mentioned. Uh, okay, this one uh, was more severe, uh, more attention to it. But but did you ever think, with your experience, that this story was so much bigger than just one let's even though it was a terrible incident but one incident or were you approaching this like okay this is one incident and mm -hmm. let's write about it and then go on mm -hmm. i think initially we understood the story to be uh you know the the scope of the story to be larger than just this particular incident but i think initially we were very closely focused on um, power line maintenance and fire risk in just explaining um, how the risk profile of the utilities service territory had changed over time and whether it had responded appropriately by changing the way that it maintained its infrastructure, whether that is you know, replacing old parts, doing closer inspections, making sure that the, the trees are the appropriate distance from the wires. Um, that was definitely our initial focus. But in really understanding the story comprehensively, there are a lot of other elements, and so in order to to get um, uh, in order to do that, we had to, like I said, you know, take a much broader look at basically twenty years of history, and, and really, 
frankly, 100 years of history when you consider um, the age of the, inf- the the transmission line that failed and started the campfire was was truly a century old. It was, you know, and it was built in the early 1920s. So I, I enjoyed the depth and the level, and I imagine the legal uh, proceedings helped you find some of this data, right? So when, when you, yes. the example, I think you, you talk about, you know, you have these linear assets that need to be inspected. And I remember somewhere in the book, you talking about, it used to take this long to, to manage, you know, to do inspections over this period. And then we'd had a quicker helicopter flight and they flew by quicker. And, and yes. eventually it got down to, was clear, at least in the legal proceedings, that, that they probably weren't doing the diligence on the lines or they couldn't have done it based on the time allotted and based on what was going on. Um, so when you write this material, are you writing it in the hope to change the industry, to change policy, to change the investors? What, who are you writing for? Well, I think, I think I'm writing for everyone. And I'll say that, you know, I think it's my hope that in spelling out the many complex factors that created these challenges that this company is still trying to manage through, it's, it's my hope that everyone has a better understanding of how these um, many different sort of story tracks or reporting tracks um, have, you know, just uh, for, for you, you mentioned investors, right? I mean, one thing that this company was doing over the course of 20 years was like many utilities, it was trying to make large capital investments on which it earned a return. And there were periods of time in which it reduced operations and maintenance expenses to the point where it really wasn't doing what it was supposed to do and keeping the assets safe. You talk to a lot of utilities across the country about cost management and you know, delivering returns to shareholders. They're very quick to say, we have this excellent policy for reducing O&M. Well, you, know, you can't cut too close to the bone, right? And so maybe just that kind of having that understanding um, prompts, you know, whether it be investors or regulators who or whoever, to do a little bit more digging as to what does that what does that plan actually look like? What are you actually going to be cutting out? Is it just, you know, technological improvements that make it so that you need, you know, fewer people in an office? That's great. But is it reducing inspection frequency or inspection, you know, thoroughness, so to speak? Um, that could be potentially problematic. And from an investor standpoint, a big liability from a regulator standpoint, uh, an issue with safety, you know, public safety and, and, uh, and well-being. So, um, so, you know, I think that just having, hopefully, um, this just allows everyone to have a better understanding of a really complex story. And you can kind of, you know, it, it can maybe change decision-making, the types of questions that are asked to these companies. Um, and, uh, you know, even from a, from a policy standpoint, um, you know, p- potentially, uh, b- better ways of, um, crafting new legislation and other things that uh, help to address some of the problems before, you know, they get out of hand. And I think you, you, for me, that hits the nail a little bit because we, we've had on the show and we discussed on the show as well, the complexity uh, around the energy industry in, in itself. There, there are so many stakeholders that are involved. There are from, from short-term political to short-term capital to, to long-term investment. There's a, there's a mix of, of, of a number of things. Uh, one thing that I thought about, and, and, and you talked about this and also and, and wrote about this in the early parts of the book where we talked about the, the infrastructure and, and the maintenance of the specific infrastructure. Are there any, are there any specific rules for a utility in the US to, to maintain this or is this to the best of their knowledge? Uh, because uh, you you would expect this is this is mission this is critical infrastructure that borderlines between should it be private or not in many countries is private and, and in the U.S. is not so so in order to maintain this which obviously they didn't uh, if if I understand it is are there any rules or is this up to the company itself to set those rules of what maintenance really means for infrastructure right right no it's a great question so um, in most cases these large utilities that we're discussing. And are privately owned, but you know, regulated. They're kind of hybrid companies in some ways. Um, it, generally overseen by state regulatory bodies, state utility commissions, and those commissions do have rules and regulations as it relates to um, maintenance and operations. Um, in California specifically, you know, a lot of the rules relate to distribution lines, the smaller networks of wires that serve homes and businesses. Um, you know, there's regulations for keeping vegetation away from live wires. 
Um, you know, there are certain inspection requirements. I found that in California, the rules for transmission, which are the, you know, the high voltage wires that take power from the generating station to the substation, there are fewer rules associated with those. And part of the reason is in California is a, a partially deregulated market. Um, and, you know, you do see that elsewhere in the country, these uh, kind of deregulated markets in which transmission is, is mostly subject to, to national oversight uh, by way of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So there's kind of a little bit of a gray area as to who sets the rules for, for maintenance and how it's enforced. Um, but I think in general, one of the bigger problems is, is not necessarily perhaps lack of rules, but perhaps lack of enforcement. You know, a lot of these regulatory bodies really don't have the, the resources or the manpower to be doing what the utility is supposed to do in, you know, making sure that everything is properly inspected and maintained. I mean, they do, they do audits. Um, there may be some infield checks, depending on the, the circumstances. Um, but I think a lot of this falls to the utilities, um, almost sort of like an honor system, <laughs> right? Um, and so... <laughs> You know, I, I, it's 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 a little bit more complicated than that, but but frankly, not much. It's definitely a ch it's been a challenge for the California Public Utilities Commission, and it's certainly a challenge for others as well. So I think it's fair to do two things at this point because we're once again we're we're, we're having an in depth conversation that I don't think all our listeners have the same visibility because Johan and I both read your book. Um, you know, clearly there was a problem that started a fire, so a utility line started a fire somehow. Um, yes. We're implying that it had to do with some sort of inspection or maintenance, and, and, and there, it's more complicated than that if you look through the M&A and the whole history of where these things are. But maybe it makes a sense to tell a little bit about the history of what, what we're talking about. Because I, I still think if I just tuned in right now, interesting topic, but I don't exactly know what we're talking about, If perhaps if I'm a listener. Is that a fair, fair, fair ask to tell a little bit about what happened? Absolutely. No? Yeah. So there are, um, uh, starting with the campfire in 2018, um, it, it happened when, so if you think about a transmission tower, one of those big, tall, lattice, often lattice structures that carry these high voltage wires, the wires hang from strings of insulator discs to keep the wires away from the metal towers. So there's no transfer of electricity, no arcing, no issues related to that. The wires hang from the insulator strings with small hooks. And what happened in the start of the campfire is that a hook um, holding up a, a wire um, attached to a string of insulator discs literally broke almost in half. And it dropped the wire, which swung against the, the metal tower. There was a flash of electricity, sparks settled in the grass below the transmission tower. And it was the start of a very, very fast moving catastrophic fire. The hook that broke had literally been in place since the line was built in the early 1920s. Um, the the so you know with time, I guess so. You know, this this actual hook, this was kind of at the top of the the string of insulator discs, and it was hooked to a plate. Over time, that hook was rocking in the wind against this metal plate. Um, the the plate kind of slowly ate through the hook, you know, forming this groove until the, eventually the hook was just too weak, and it and it and it broke essentially. And so um, that the wear on that hook had been visible for a very, very long time, very long time, decades. There was one estimate that, you know, it was 50 years, maybe. Um, you know, and frankly, I mean, some of these transmission line parts were kind of experimental. This is like one of the first big transmission networks built in the U.S., you know, and um, but the, the, the company never saw it. The, the inspection practices that the company had in place weren't thorough enough to really um, to, to see that wear. And there was, you know, other tiny little pieces of hardware on other lines in the vicinity that were showing the same sorts of problems. So it's pretty easy to understand, right? I mean, they, they weren't looking at it closely enough. The stuff was really old. Eventually it fails. There's another bucket of problems that PG also faces, which is it, it is kind of in this perpetual... Um, tree trimming cycle <laughs> because it, that, that's a dynamic risk, right? There's, there's trees that get too close to um, smaller lines because, you know, when you think about it, a big transmission line, trees aren't really a problem because they're, they exist in pretty wide rights of way. Um, unlike, um, you know, distribution lines in which they're, they're closer to, 
sorry, <laughs> talk <laughs> closer to homes and businesses. Okay, and so we, they have to make sure that there's, there's appropriate clearance away from those wires. And, you know, they contract out all this work. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Are we good? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, when people walk by the apartment, she gets. So there's another set of challenges the pg &E faces as it relates to distribution lines, which are smaller wires uh, close to homes and businesses. You know, unlike transmission lines that exist in pretty large rights of way, uh, these wires are at risk of encroaching trees. Um, and so the company has to make sure that there's the appropriate clearance between the small wire and the branches, because if the branches hit the tree, or excuse me, if the branches hit the wire, um, that can ignite fires as well. And that was the primary problem in the in the series of 2017 wildfires in, in October um, that destroyed a lot of of, of uh, the Napa and Sonoma area. So, um, so th those are the challenges as it relates to you know transmission, really old infrastructure, um, distribution wires, um, uh, cl tree clearance, and it's it's just one of those things in which you know trees grow, um, and so it's this it, they can never stop. It's just this perpetual cycle that they go through on a seasonal basis and um it's definitely really challenging so it's, it's interesting so between the time you sent me your book and the time we're speaking i was at distributech in, in dallas and i was talking to a number of folks and you gave me a whole new appreciation for a whole class of startups that that i interact with that either help with tree management whether it's drones or other technology or satellite technology to help the energy companies manage their assets there is um some AI kind of stuff that people are using to manage linear assets. There, there's all kinds of different technology to help solve this problem. And I kept thinking back to your book on, wow, if they only had these technologies just a few years ago, they, they could probably have managed some of these things. So, so I, think, I think the world is listening and I think it's changing. Um, I think I'd like to change gears a little bit than where we're going because this didn't just happen because of old infrastructure. I mean, there's a little bit of a corporate history of M&A and how they got to hold these assets, but also, you know, there, there were business drivers and things that were, were taking place on the side. So I don't know, maybe we can switch gears and see, I mean, you're, you're, you take different threads through your story and different perspectives of, of what happened. So let's look at it from the business point of view. What, what was going on, on on the company side and, and, and how did it end up or where did it go, right? It's yeah. still interesting journey. Yeah, absolutely. So just very, very briefly in terms of the history of PG&E and the history of some of these um, super old assets that we're talking about, you know, PG&E grew by way of acquisition in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, at a time when there was a, a bunch of dozens of tiny little power companies popping up to serve different areas. Um, PG&E bought up all these small companies. There was a one that was larger and its only real competitor. Ultimately, the two merged in 1930. With it, it acquired these very old transmission assets that we're, we're talking about. The merger in 1930 is really the time where it's you know, very much conventional wisdom that these utilities should operate as protective monopolies, as regulated monopolies who are going to own every, um, you know, they're, they're going to own everything. They're going to own power generation. They're going to own power lines. And, um, and they're going to, you know, make their authorized rate of return on investments in these assets. Fast forward to the 1990s, you have this national push to deregulate the energy, the electricity sector specifically, and make it so that, um, you know, independent companies can come in and own generation and compete to sell that power. Um, California was one of the first to experiment with this. It was a pretty disastrous experiment in the beginning. Um, the way that the legislation, the deregulation legislation was crafted, um, just made it so that the utilities ended up racking up a lot of debt. There was manipulation of the of the market in the early days. Um, eventually, PG&E has to seek bankruptcy protection. Um, specifically, it's it's uh, the the regulated utility side of it. Um, and so, the the upshot of that is that, you know, uh, California kind of made some tweaks, reestablished a competitive wholesale market, um, but the utilities would no longer own generation. They would essentially contract to purchase the power from other companies that are going to be building the assets. Um, around the time PG&E emerges from bankruptcy in the 2004-2005 timeframe, 
the California legislature is expressing real interest in setting some ambitious targets for developing renewable energy. Um, and so what that means is the utilities are going to be required to purchase wind and solar power um, to meet certain state specified targets. And they get steadily more ambitious over the course of the next decade, you know, 2005 and 2010 to 2015. Um, you know, on the, in the early days, wind and solar were relatively expensive relative to other, other forms of generation. Um, the, the collectively, the California utilities really helped to create the economies of scale necessary to drive down costs of future projects, but some of their early contracts were very expensive. And so rather than earning a return on own generation by building wind and solar, they just have contracts which are passed through costs to consumers. You know, so their expense profile is is um, is going up as they acquire more expensive contracts. Um, also, post bankruptcy, you see a real interest in in trying to please shareholders and trying to reestablish the company as a strong financial performer. And you know, I think the CEO who kind of guided the company immediately post bankruptcy had a strategy in place that really wasn't it really wasn't appropriate you know in terms of its emphasis on certain capital investments at the expense of operations and maintenance and one of the challenges that you saw sort of immediately as a consequence of that was issues with uh, inspecting gas transmission pipelines because pg e also has a gas business um, in 2010 there was a large pipeline explosion south of san francisco that killed eight people and it brought to light some of the the ways in which the company had been cutting inspection costs over time. And um, ultimately, just to kind of wrap this up, you can sort of see the same dynamic manifest on the electric side. I don't think I don't think it was quite as shareholder driven that dynamic. I think part of it was also just trying to manage the cost that had accrued um, from some of those early renewable energy contracts, but. Ultimately, you, you you see some very strong parallels, um, and uh, so that kind of brings you into the 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 um, the troubles in 2017 and 2018 as it related to um, you know both both tree trimming and the the management of the transmission assets. So that's that's a that's a brief history of the company. <laughs> Now, I think think that was helpful for me to, to see the journey, and, and, and you go through it in quite a bit of detail, but in kind of a very compelling way because you, you you see the implications of, of the decisions that management made. Um, I guess, though, with infrastructure, isn't it just a, a dumb question because Johan and I are really good at dumb questions. That's what we pride ourselves on. Um, isn't it inherent, though, that there's some risk to have utilities and have power lines running through wooded areas and and, and wilderness type land or even just outdoors is it a risk that's expected as part of this and is it just a question of managing the risk business better or like if you're going to move absolutely. power there's got to be some inherent risk right or gas totally. or whatever there absolutely is there's no question about that there is inherent risk and i think that this is a really interesting question because i think in the case of pg e this has always been an inherent risk but the consequences of that risk have changed uh, over time. And so whereas maybe, you know, at, this, at, the, at the time of deregulation, let's say, or let's say 20 years ago, um, you know, you had healthier forests. You didn't have as many dead trees. Um, you uh, didn't have as many people living in the wooded foothills of the Sierra. So fast forward 20 years, you know, what might have been a manageable fire 20 years ago quickly barrels out of control and has the potential to be more deadly and more destructive by virtue of the way the development has happened. Um, so the question is, does the risk tolerance necessarily have to change because the consequences have changed? Um, and I think that what was very interesting to me is the company has a relatively new CEO. She's been in the role for a little more than a year now. Um, almost going on to. And um, uh, so she, she, very pretty shortly after she became CEO um, at the beginning of last year, you know, deep in the Feather River Canyon, which is very close to the town of Paradise that was destroyed in the campfire, um, this tree falls onto a little distribution line, becomes the second largest fire in California history. Um, and so she takes a look at this and she's like, 
man, we have so many millions of trees within strike distance of our lines. And we're constantly working to to mitigate that risk. You know, we're constantly sending out tr- crews and bucket trucks to, to, you know, to do whatever they can to bait the risk, but the risk will never be zero. You know, we can never fully get ahead of this. So let's let's rethink the entire approach to asset management. And she's she's proposed burying 10,000 miles of distribution wire. Um, this is going to be hugely challenging from an engineering standpoint, from a labor standpoint, and from a cost management standpoint. So, you know, we shall see how that transpires. But the fact that she wanted to put forth that new strategy, I think, suggests to me a mode of thinking that's like, okay, what's happened historically and the way that we've managed this stuff historically is not going to work going forward. And I think that you're beginning to see some similar questions um, posed by CEOs and, and directors of other utilities being like, the risk profile of your service territory has changed somehow. You know, do you need to, to change um, your approach to risk management as uh, in response? And, and where does the capital come from these kind? Of, I mean, that would be a tremendously capital intensive to bury t- that much line. So absolutely, who finds this and where does that kind of invest come from? Because do you get a better return or is it because you go bankrupt because you've killed people and you end up in lawsuits? I mean, right, right. Where do you find so, someone to put that kind of capital in? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I think that certainly the company is going to have more general challenges raising capital in the in the, in the wake of these disasters. Um, you know, it's uh, so one big thing that I missed as a result of in my little brief retelling of this company history is the campfire ultimately pushed the company to seek bankruptcy protection a second time. And they emerged from that very complicated restructuring not especially financially sound, frankly. It merged with more debt than it than it went in with. Um, it was kind of a mess. And so as a result of all that, yes, I think that kind of, you know, and their, their share price hasn't really rebounded since then. You know, it's, it's going to be definitely more challenging and more expensive, but they have their minds that they can, I guess, you know, over the course of a period of time, raise an estimated $20 billion in capital. And, you know, with that comes a return on the investment. And that's essentially borne by ratepayers. They haven't proposed anything that would be any sort of ratepayer shareholder split, and um, that's a challenging prospect when you when you're talking about the fact that first of all, rates in California are quite high, in part because of those early investments in renewables, but also because the each of the big three utilities is making you know big capital expenditures to try to improve the health of the the assets and the infrastructure um, to mitigate fire fire risk, right? Um, some of that's actually investing in, you know, replacements and other things. Some of it's just expense in terms of trimming trees, but, you know, suffice it to say rates are going up, have continued to go up. And then you have this big capital project that you want to embark upon. That's going to be a really challenging conversation with the regulator. Um, already, I mean, there's proceedings in front of the, the regulators as it relates to affordability throughout the entire state. So, um, it's it's not an easy prospect. I think theoretically it's a very good idea, but it comes with a huge number of challenges. Do you, do you see rebellion cities like San Francisco and, and and cities just not willing to go through the pain and looking for alternatives still? Is that something still on their radar or are they willing to hunker down and go for the ride? So San Francisco is a good example in that there's been numerous occasions in the last number of years in which the, the city has proposed creating its own municipal utility, essentially buying the assets from pg e and creating a little city-run city run utility, essentially. Um, and that's just so far been unsuccessful. Um, you know, pg e has to agree to sell those assets and it has not agreed to do so. Uh, but it's, it's kind of hard to know it, well, I mean, for San Francisco, the thing about San Francisco is it's kind of spared the worst of pg es problems for a few reasons. One, you know, by just by virtue of the territory, it's not San Francisco itself is not particularly prone to fire risk. The surrounding area is prone to prone to fires, but not San Francisco itself. Um, the other thing is because it's such a dense, you know, population base, the company's done a lot of work to make sure that the assets serving the city are among the more reliable in the system. The other thing too is is one thing PG&E has started doing in the last several years is it started proactively turning off the fire when there's excuse me turning off the power when there's high risk of fire, um, and because the city isn't at imminent risk of fire, it's usually spared 
when the, when the, you do these when the company does these uh, preemptive shutoffs. So it's it's really kind of more of a you know kind of a screw you to PG&E than anything else. Like I don't think it necessarily solves a great number of problems, and in fact, it has the potential to create problems for those who remain within PG&E service territory because you've you know you've removed a pretty you know dense population base from the service territory and it's has if you you know maybe not so much san francisco itself but if you set that precedent you see more defections then you kind of you, you lose the number of people who are paying into the system and that creates higher costs for everyone else so um there is certainly interest in that and in san francisco is not the only city that has expressed interest in trying to do this but you know, so far those efforts have been non-starters, and it's unclear exactly the extent to which that would solve some of the issues. And hypothetically, you know, if you have, let's say, let's just say that you know the town of Santa Rosa in Sonoma County wanted to do this, um, and and succeeded in doing so, the um, there's a California constitutional construct in which any utility, whether it be publicly owned or privately owned, any utility that starts a fire. Is liable for property damage so all of a sudden the muni becomes responsible for those financial costs you know so there's ownership is um is it's a tricky thing and i'm not exactly totally sure what sort of ownership change would actually be beneficial in trying to address these underlying problems but on the, on the other on the, on the larger scale on the discussions what are the options because uh uh that, that are discussed because I can understand that this is a kind of a ticking bomb and no one wants it. It's kind of thrown around. If it's, if you're liable for something that is not perfectly working, who wants it? Uh, so, so, but, but, but at the yeah. end of the day, so we need been... the energy. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, for a while there was the, there was an idea well, first of all, there's ever since these these problems have become really acute, there's been sort of a veiled uh, threat of a state takeover. State doesn't really want that. First of all, it'd be really expensive, right? That'd be a really expensive undertaking by the state, and the state would still be liable for damages resulting from fires. It's unclear whether the state would be in a better position to manage this utility than the utility itself. Um, there was also an idea to to um, make it into a customer owned cooperative. So if you think about alternatives to private utility ownership, there are basically two options. One is municipal utilities, as we were discussing, and the other is these cooperatives, essentially like, you know, utilities owned by their members, um, governed by a board that sort of sets rates independently of any sort of regulatory body. Um, generally speaking, co-ops are relatively small. They serve rural areas in, in the United States in which you don't have the same density uh, you don't have the same population dense service territory. Um, so PG&E would be a very different breed of cooperative. Um, in, in some way, so that removes the shareholder uh, dynamic. It removes the need to deliver returns. And so in that sense, you know, maybe you have a better focus on, on, on maintenance um, as a result of that. You know, you don't have the pressure to reduce expenses um, to create more room to make capital investments. I mean, there's there's a benefit associated with that, but there's still the issue of, of liability. And um, there's also the issue of getting pg e to agree to this sort of restructuring. And so far it has had no interest in that. So um, there's kind of like, there's the theoretical um, debate about what could be done, but then there's also the practical debate. And, you know, it's it's hard to change the, the, the um, it's hard to change these things once they're once they're established and you know there's 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 reason also to say like in a perfect world the you know having better access to capital by virtue of you know actually being able to raise debt and equity in the way that you can if you're an investor and utility you know it, it should create you know good efficiencies and um you know give them you know, greater access to resources necessary to run this business um it's just the, the challenge of, main, of balancing public and private interests has historically been a challenge for PG&E as well as other utilities. So I, I think the other aspect that was interesting to me was the aspect of the equity and folks coming in, even during the disaster, even during the lawsuit and getting bondholders and all the jockeying 
Oh, yeah. and, and I've seen this in other corporate in U.S. corporate with the exact same names. I think when we talked to the pre-call, I said this reminds me of reading about Caesars and, 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 and the the same equity groups and, and you know really taking advantage of being you know, the first right bond holders. And you know if you're a shareholder or if you were you know if you were impacted by the fire and you became a shareholder, you know where did you sit in the feeding chain of of the the packages put together after the fire? Um, that was really interesting. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that, because to me, that was, that, that was a pretty interesting part of the story. Yeah, absolutely. So pg es second restructuring after the campfire was, it was complex for a lot of reasons. Um, so the reason why pg e sought bankruptcy is that it estimated it owed about $30 billion to in compensation uh, as a result of the 2017 fires, the campfire in 2018 and uh, a fire in 2015. Um, and so um, that's a lot of money, clearly. And so it has to, but first of all, it kind of has to arrive at settlements with um, different parties, you know, one comprised of victims and businesses whose homes and, and properties were destroyed uh, in the various fires, one to insurance claim holders. So if an insurer has paid you a claim, you know, a fire claim, um, the, the company can seek reimbursement for that claim from the company um, by virtue of this liability contract that we've been discussing. And then there's a, you know, the, the third uh, contingent is basically agencies, governmental agencies that incurred costs uh, in terms of fire suppression and, and uh, rebuilding and other things like that. So um, had to reach settlements with each of these parties. As it's working through all of this, you had competing... Um, you had basically two competing plans of reorganization, one put forth by um, some equity holders that came in. I mean, so largely speaking, um, hedge funds that specialized in, in distressed restructurings um, took major interest in this bankruptcy very shortly after the company filed. And so um, they kind of formed two factions, um, one being one led by some of the, the largest shareholders and one led by some of the largest bondholders. Um, you know, of course, the shareholders want to preserve the value of their equity. The bondholders were essentially saying, you know, we can um, raise a lot of equity at the exist of ex uh, existing shareholders and take ownership of the company ourselves. And um, and so the challenge with the shareholders who ultimately won out is that they didn't really want to raise a lot more equity um, because that would dilute the value of their holding. So it became kind of a, a cash constrained situation. The company didn't really have a lot of cash. It was trying to figure out how to parcel out that cash through its various settlements. Um, so the, this is the interesting part of this. So it first reaches a settlement with the governmental agencies for a billion dollars in cash. Then it's negotiating with the insurance groups. And so these aren't just insurance groups at this point. There was also a number of hedge funds that bought these claims on the secondary market for like pennies on the dollar. And took a very strong role in negotiating that settlement. Ultimately, um, the company agrees to pay them $11 billion in cash, which is ostensibly less than what they were owed. But nevertheless, the company doesn't really have any much, much more cash left at this point. So it has to settle with the, the businesses and the, and the individual fire victims. Well, you know, they're, um, so ultimately they reach a, a settlement that's $13.5 billion, um, but it only has about enough cash for about half of that. So the rest they're going to, they provide in the form of, of shares in the company um, uh, th through the administration of a trust that's going to you know manage all this cash and, and stock uh, for you know basically slow compensation over time, and that was very upsetting for a lot of fire victims. You know just the, I mean just the idea of indirectly holding shares in the company that that burned down their house and you know the, the share price hasn't rebounded since their bankruptcy, so the, the the value of the assets in the trust is not worth. What's supposed to be worth, <laughs> um, and the you know, the company, or excuse me, the trust owns about twenty plus percent of the company, so it can't just liquidate all these shares at one time for the sake of compensating the victims. It's going to have to be done over the course of years, and I mean, some of these people have been without compensation since 2015, 2017. You know, we're in 2022, um, so the whole thing was enormously challenging, and there were winners and there were losers, and the losers were the fire victims. Well, it's, it's, it's an incredible story. I, I don't think we do it justice in a short podcast. Um, but w what I'd like to say to my listeners is the book comes out August 1st. And if you're like me, you're going to love it because 
It's got a business angle. It's got a page turning angle. It really, if you're in the energy industry, if you understand the utilities, you're going to appreciate what's happened. Um, for me, I really appreciate you sharing with us. I, you, it, it, I love reading the story and then I, I like getting your, your insight from the on, on, on the side. So thank you from my perspective. Johan, do you have any final I, I really enjoyed uh, the, the book. I really enjoyed this interview. So thank you very much for, for, for coming along. You leave me with a thought. Uh, and I'm, not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna ask you to answer it, but you leave me with a thought. And that is, I wonder if it's worth for some of these companies um, uh, just to go on as it used to be and pay the fines. Uh, and, and kind of, we'll see it tomorrow. It's gonna, more people's gonna move into these areas. It's going to be a warmer climate. The forest is not going to do this. We're going to see more of this. I'm just, I'm slightly afraid <laughs> that, uh, that that it's not it's not taking enough seriousness around this, especially from a corporate point of view. I could be wrong, but you leave me with a little bit of a nagging thought about this. But really fascinating. So thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Me. I mean, that's that's a thought that everyone should should sort of ponder, you know. And I think that. Um, the answer to that in the United States, it kind of it kind of varies by region and, and what the what the risk is to the company from um, from a financial standpoint and, and other things. But um, definitely a thought worth thinking about. And um, so just by point of fact, the so the book comes out August 30th. Oh, I sorry. wish it was August 1st because I can't wait. I can't wait for it to hit the shelves <laughs> and see what everyone thinks. But I'm so glad that you both enjoyed it. And thank well, you, thank you again for being on the podcast. Uh, August 30th is just around the corner. You can pre-order the book right now. Go to wherever you get your book. I would recommend pre-ordering it. You're not going to regret it. It's going to be a great read. Um, we look forward to speaking to you again in the future. I, I hope we can touch base again. I enjoy reading your articles and the, the work you're doing in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, for our audience, you've enjoyed another episode of Insider's Guide to Energy. If you've enjoyed this content, Go, go pre-order the book, go chase it down, subscribe, forward this episode, and don't forget to follow us on YouTube. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Have a great day.